for coming. This is going to be a good talk. I think you're going to like it. It's going to be fun. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be back here. Um, it's my second time in Malmo. I was here. The last time I was here, the Eurovision was here. I don't know if you recall, it was a few years ago. Uh, it was, uh, it's a lot calmer in the city this time around than it was the last time. That was a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, a story this afternoon about lean, agile, and design thinking. Uh, my background is in design. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in the agile space. I've been doing a lot of work in the lean startup space over the years, and I've seen a lot of, uh, of the attempt to make these ideas work well together. I'm going to share some of those ideas with you today. Give me some things to take home, some practical tips that you can use, hopefully, to make your teams be more successful, build better products, satisfy your customers' needs, and ultimately build better businesses. That's the goal. But to get started, uh, I want to tell you a story about my favorite movie. Always a good place to start. My favorite movie is Goodfellas. How many of you have not seen Goodfellas? Damn, I don't have that kind of time. We don't have two hours to sit here and watch it and then talk about it, although we should, that would be a great presentation. Um, Goodfellas, if you don't know, it's, it's one of the quintessential kind of American gangster movies, right? Uh, fantastic movie with, with uh, an amazing cast and great lines. The, there's, it's a movie filled with great scenes and great dialogue, but this is my favorite scene in the movie. Now, you have, most of you haven't seen the movies, which is kind of, um, so I'm gonna spoil a little scene for you, just one, one tiny bit of the movie. So what's happening in this scene? So this is, um, you've got Robert De Niro, obviously, you've got Ray Liotta there on the left, and you've got Joe Pesci there to the right of Ray Liotta. Now, um, they're gangsters, and they have a problem, and it's in the back of Ray Liotta's car. That's where the problem is. And they're stopping in uh, late at night to Joe Pesci's mom's house, that's Joe Pesci's mom, to pick up a knife, a big butcher knife, that they need to solve the problem that's in the back of Ray Liotta's car. That's what's happening in this scene. Now it's late at night, they stop in, and uh, she wakes up, it's an Italian household, and she says, no, 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 you gotta stay and eat. You can't just come in and pick up the knife and go, you gotta stay, you gotta have a meal, you gotta eat. So they sit down, and they're having this late night meal, and as they're sitting around uh, and having a conversation late at night, uh, the, the conversation turns to this painting. And she, it's her painting, she painted it, and she passes it around the table. And as they're talking about it, uh, Joe Pesci says what is one of the more memorable lines in a movie filled with memorable lines. And I have a clip of that, 30-second 30, 30 clip of that, uh, what he says in this particular scene. Here's what he says, listen. Don't ever tell me about my painting. No. Look at this. That's ah, beautiful. I like this one. The dog, one dog goes one way and the other dog goes the other way. One well, is going east and the other one is going west. So what? And this guy's saying, what do you want from me? <laughs> All right. So if you haven't seen it, at least you have a teaser now. Like the whole movie's like this. It's fantastic. You, you really have to see it. Look, he says, he says, one dog's going one way, one dog's going the other way, and you got this guy in the middle saying, hey, what do you want from me? Right? Um, I'm from New Jersey, by the way. I can talk like that. Um, and, and look, wh what does this have to do with software development? You might be asking yourself. Um, well, first of all, that's not my presentation. Um, I'm not <laughs> really sure what's happening there. Um, but that's fantastic. I mean, that, that's my desktop, and it's lovely. It's not really clear what happened to my... <laughs> my pro oh, there it goes. Okay, it's back now. Um, so you might be asking yourself, what does that have to do with software development? Well, I'll tell you. So I was working with a client of mine. A client uh, in, in the US happened to be a bank in this particular case. It was a big bank, and I was dealing with one of their transformation managers. You know, all the banks are transforming these days. They're all becoming digital companies, right? And I was talking to my client, and he was, he was in charge of transforming his cross-functional development team into a modern software product development team. And he said, look, I'm teaching my tech guys Agile. I got one guy, one dog going one way, right? Uh, I'm teaching my product folks lean and lean startup in the enterprise. I got one dog going the other way, right? Now, in his particular case, he actually had a third dog. He had his design team. Design team's going a third way. He's like, I'm teaching them design thinking. And this magical synthesis, this nexus of process and collaboration and shared understanding and language and, and amazing product success isn't happening. They don't have a shared language. 
they don't know how to work together. They have different rhythms, different cadences, and they're not, uh, you know, th this, this amazing burst of creativity, collaboration, agility isn't working. And I'm here in the middle saying, hey, what do you want from me? I trained everybody in all the modern stuff, right? I got agile training, I got product management training, I got designer, design thinking training, and it's just not coming together, and I can't figure out why. Now, this really got me thinking to understand, because, again, in, in, in all respects, he's doing all the right things in this particular case, right? Um, and it got me really thinking about the problems that he was trying to solve. And what he was doing in this case, and what I see happening in a lot of the organizations that I work with, is this, is that we try to fix everything with process, right? We've got this, the, these, these process hammers, right? The agile process hammer. It doesn't work, hit it with the agile hammer, right? It doesn't work, hit it with the lean or the lean startup hammer. I've design thinking, we've got a design thinking hammer now. Let's just hit it with the design thinking hammer, and, and hope that it will make things better, right? We have the sense that if we just apply the right amount of process, everything will start to work better. There'll be better collaborations, better conversations, with the ultimate goal of building better software for our customers. And the reality is that uh, this isn't true. How do we get around this? Now, as I was thinking about this, it, it dawned on me that startups don't have this problem, right? Startups generally uh, have a small amount of people. Right? And so there's no real deep discussion about are we agile, are we lean, are we going to use design thinking, right? Everybody's working very quickly to make sure that we don't run out of runway because if we make enough wrong decisions enough times, we will run out of runway and we will go out of business. But some startups get lucky and they find product market fit and they scale and they grow to become larger and larger and larger companies. And as the companies grow, we have more options. We have more choices because we have more money. First of all, we can hire specialists, whereas before we could hire somebody who maybe could do two jobs, now we can hire individuals, right? We can uh, build larger teams, and it feels like we have seemingly endless runway, like we can just keep going forever because, generally speaking, as the companies get larger and larger and larger, if you make, enough mis if you make mistakes, nothing really happens. Very rarely does someone actually get fired, even in the United States, right? It doesn't really happen that someone gets fired for making a big mistake. And, and most importantly, larger organizations assume they already know everything. We're big. We're successful. We're the market leader, right? Why do we have to, you know, to, to do anything differently at this point? Look how big and successful and market leading we are, right? And yet, and yet, in all of my travels, and I, I work uh, uh, in, with companies around the world, I see this all the time, these talking heads. We want to be lean. We want to be agile. We want to recapture that innovative spirit we had as a startup. We seem to have lost the speed, the time to market. I don't know if that phrase resonates with you, right? How do we recapture that? How do we bring that together? And the interesting thing is that if you read the material on lean, agile, design, thinking, it seems to focus on a single team, right? Here's how you make your team agile. Here's how you make your uh, team lean or apply design thinking to a team. But when you take those processes and you stretch them to larger and larger and larger organizations, to more teams, five teams, 15, 50, 500 teams, they seem to break. And so the question is why? So to answer the question why, I did some scientific research. And by scientific research, I mean I asked Twitter. That's it, I just posed the question to Twitter. That was the extent of my scientific research. And these were the answers that came back. These were the themes that came back from my scientific research exercise, my Twitter research exercise, right? These were the themes, and these are, to be clear, I got a lot more answers than this. But these are the themes that I see consistently with every organization that I work with, right? We already know what we need to do. Why do we need to waste time learning? Again, we're big, we're successful, we're market leading. Let's just ship more software. Uh, process. Everything has a process, 85 approvals, and a mysterious they that block anything that's not the old way of working. That seems to be a big deal, particularly in larger organizations. Um, uh, lots of upfront planning. If we don't write an 85-page business case for this thing, no one's going to approve it or fund it. So we have to, and then, and then we have to live and die by the numbers that we put in that business case and by the date that we put in that case as well. Uh, silos, right, so no collaborations, developers not talking to designers, designers not talking to product managers, and so forth. Um, valuing business need 
over user need, and not realizing they're the same thing. So short-term gains, right? Not actually thinking about who's the customer, what are we trying to make, uh, how are we trying to make them successful? And then lastly, um, worrying about our brand, right? That seems to keep companies away from these agile and lean practices at, at scale because there's an expectation of a level of service, and if we put out lighter weight, less functional products, maybe less polished products, that may damage the brand, and we don't want to do that. Now, the interesting thing is that when I started down this path, there wasn't a lot of material about uh, Agile, as I told you, it was kind of uh, at scale. It was focused on, on individual teams. But today, as you start to look and to try to, uh, out there, if, if you're in any kind of a leadership, team leadership position or organizational leadership position, and you're trying to figure out how to build this collaboration and how to build this collaboration at scale, there's no shortage of recipes out there. Everybody's out there trying to sell you some kind of a framework that will allow you to then scale these practices and build that kind of collaboration. And perhaps there's no better, better visualization of that framework, of those options, than this chart. Now look, this chart is terrible. And in fact, the first time I saw this chart, I felt like this, right? And you should too. Look, this chart is terrible, not because of the aesthetic choices that this designer, uh, this uh, consultant made. Now look, by the way, if you haven't seen this before, what this is is, well, it says it. It's the Agile Landscape, version three, by the way. So uh, maybe there's a version four. He caught a lot of crap on Twitter for this particular chart. But look, and uh, unjustly so, I believe. Um, this is a terrible chart, not because of the aesthetic choices. So what's happening here, if you can't see it, um, th every one of the stops on this London tube map style illustration is a technique that's broadly uh, discussed or used in the Agile world. Everything is on here. Scrum, extreme programming, Kanban, five whys, design sprints, spikes, literally everything. Everything is on here, right? Now, the reason why this is a terrible chart is not because of the aesthetic choices that this consultant made. It's because it's true, right? These are your options. You're trying to build a better collaboration. Like my client, right, he went out into the world and he's like, okay, here are all my choices. I chose the three things that seemed to be the most relevant, the most popular, and I tried to put them together, and it didn't work, right? And so the question then becomes, how do we get away from this Right? and into a more uh, tangible, practical way of building better collaborations between software developers, designers, and product managers, and ultimately building better products and services for the people that we service. Okay? So let's talk about this for just a second. So what's Agile really about? It's not going to be a crash course in Agile, I, I promise you. Is that me? Jeez, sorry. Let's not do that again. Um, Agile was conceived by 17 software engineers on a mountain in Utah at high altitude where the air was thin <laughs> 17 years ago as a bid to, you know, to, to overcome this frustration that they had with software development. It was unpredictable. It was complex. It was difficult to meet customer needs. It was difficult to predict budgets and deadlines. And they figured there had to be a better way. And so at the end of that long weekend on the mountaintop, they descended biblically from the mountain giving us the Agile Manifesto. Now, the Agile Manifesto, if you've read it, and it's short, you should read it, it doesn't say things in there like, you will stand up every day at 9.15 for 15 minutes, right? None of that crap is in there, right? It really doesn't. It doesn't. It's a philosophy for work. It really is, and it's a good one overall. And perhaps the most important part is this piece. They're just saying, look, software development is complex and unpredictable, okay? As you start to build stuff, you will learn new things, or new things will happen in the world. As you discover that change, if it shifts the plan that you originally made for the product that you're building, change course. That's it. That's agility in a nutshell. Like we could end the session here, you can go home and say, I learned what Agile is at Eurodev, right? But that's literally it. You make a plan, you start to work, and as you discover new things, if they disagree with your plan, you change the plan. That's all these guys were saying, is that we work differently. And yet, what's happened is that most organizations have taken the Agile process and they've productized it, and they bring it in, and they hire it for a different purpose. Not for agility, right? Not for responsiveness, but to create more high-quality code faster. 
That's why most organizations, they're bringing in for productivity, for efficiency, right? That's why most organizations bring in Agile, right? Because there's this belief, right, that this is what software engineers have to be doing all day long, right? Literally, there's, there can be no break. If a software engineer steps away uh, from their keyboard at any given moment, right, bad stuff's going to happen, really bad stuff. And why, right? Why? Because this is what we care about, making the software, right? Velocity, that's what we optimize for. That's, what, that's what's happening, right? The spirit was learning agility responsiveness. The reality is this, let's crank out features, Right? High quality features as fast as we can. And there's this belief that the more features we make, the more value we deliver. Right? And that's one of the things we have to get away from. Right? Because the reality is this. Just because you can build it does not mean that you should. For example, the airplane that got me here has seven fewer wings than this airplane. And it worked just fine. Right, to get here as well. So that's, that's, you know, start to think about Agile, that's kind of where we end up. Well, let's talk about Lean for a second. Lean is fantastic in that Lean, if, if you take it, again, in spirit, I'm going to give you a 30-second conversation around Lean, you know there are volumes like this thick on it, so forgive me if I cut this short, right? But basically, the, the guys at Toyota were struggling with a production and quality issue, right? They, they were dealing with a post-World War II Japan when you've got the American car manufacturers like GM and Ford producing tons and tons and tons of cars. Toyota says, look, we can't compete on quantity, so we are going to compete on quality, efficiency, and variety. And to do that, we are going to completely turn the manufacturing process on its head. Now what they're doing here is they're saying, look, traditionally car manufacturing is a push process. Push means we're just going to make product and push it onto the market and hope that people use it. We can't afford that because if we make stuff that people don't buy or don't use, we go out of business. So they turn it on its head. They say, look, we're going to make a pull model. A pull model simply says, we're going to look for signals from the market that tell us what to make, when to make it, where to make it, and how much of it to make. And then we're only going to do that. And all that stuff in the middle is waste. We're going to minimize that because we can't afford it. And along the way, we are going to trust our people, the people who make the product, the people closest to the product, to make the tactical day-to-day -day decisions because they're the closest to the product, they have the, 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 the most feedback, the most understanding of what's happening here. We're going to empower them to make those decisions. That's what Lean does. And, what, and, and the amazing part here is that Lean, if you, if you start to try to combine Lean and Agile together, it should put a brain on that Agile delivery process because it infuses this concept that you can't predict the future. Right? That's what lean thinking is about. It's about we, we're, we're moving from a position of doubt to a position of certainty, always. And to reduce the risk of going too far in the wrong direction, we work in small batches. Sprints, iterations, short cycles help us get there and move forward more quickly. And so we've got that. Now, Eric Ries uh, did a nice job in 2011 by talking about this in Lean Startup. He said, look, start asking yourselves for everything that you're working on, not can we build it, but should we build it, right? Do customers want it? Will they pay for it? And if so, terrific. Then we can try to scale it and build a business around it, and we can run experiments to learn this. The problem with Lean Startup, particularly in high-growth companies and large companies, is that nobody wants to buy experiments. They want to buy apps. They want to buy systems. And so we're dealing with that. Now, the last thing before we start to solve all this stuff is design thinking. Right? Super popular. Right? Big in a lot of companies. This is what most people think it is. Can't do design thinking without the post-it notes. <coughs> Some people think it's this. All right, we lock ourselves in a room for a week generate some creativity. It's not any of these things. It's this. It's simply saying, look, designers have some tools for solving design problems. Let's take those same tools and apply them to business problems, right? And this stuff should sound familiar to you if you know anything about sort of the core principles of agility and the core principles of lean startup, right? We want to empathize. We want to understand the customer. What are they trying to do? We want to define solutions, we want to ideate uh, on those solutions, create some, some variations, we want to prototype and test them, and then based on what we learn, we're going to, to maybe productize some of these things or build them, right? 
So we talk a lot about that. Now, the nice thing is that at least two of these things work well together. The design thinking process fits nicely into the lean startup, build, measure, learn loop. It's the learn piece. It's in there, right? How do we learn? We, we do all this prototyping and that type of thing. And then organizations, right, try to bring this in together with the agile piece as well. And this is where, where it starts to really struggle because we're trying to mesh these three processes together that have different languages and different cadences and different measures of success. This is where my client was ultimately struggling. At best, this is what I've seen customers do. They build some kind of a Frankenstein process that is, you know, kind of works and is kind of weird and awkward and makes some weird noises, right? But doesn't really function to the best possible ability. So the question is, how do we bring these things together? Okay. Well, most importantly, we need to integrate the principles of these ideas, not the processes. Trying to layer these processes on top of each other ends up in that Frankenstein situation. But the principles, the principles of agility, the principles of lean thinking, the principles of design thinking work really well together. I want to share with you 10 of those principles in the time that I have left and tactics for each of those principles to help you at least think about this. When you go back to work, think about how might we change the way that we work to apply some of these principles because this is the way that we should actually be working if we're looking to build customer-centric, successful services, products, right, and then ultimately businesses around that. Let's start with this one. Principle number one, customer value and business value are the same thing. It's true. You make your customers successful. You respect their time. You help them achieve their goal, make them better at work, make them better in their home life, get them home to their kids' football game on time. Right? They will reward you. They'll tell their friends. They'll tell the internet. They'll tell their boss. They'll buy more stuff from you. Ignoring customer value and optimizing for short-term business value is risky and can cost you the success of your company. Let me show you uh, a recent story. Gibson Guitars is out of business. Did you guys know that? It's really sad. They went bankrupt. Gibson Guitars noticed a shift in the marketplace. No one was buying guitars anymore right? Drastic drop off in sales. And so they brought in a new CEO. The CEO was all about innovation, right? All they wanted to do was velocity. Let's make more stuff, more innovative pedals, more new technologies, new fancier guitars integrated with those technologies. And they pushed that out there and they pushed all this innovative stuff out there for the sake of innovation, not because any customer was actually asking for it and nobody bought it and they went out of business. And they continued to focus on the things that made them successful to this point, right? We're big, we're successful, we're the market leader. Why would we change our approach to our business? And this is what the Gibson Guitar website looks like today. Now, what they fail to recognize is that, yes, sales were dropping off, but there were new buyers coming on. And 50% of those new buyers were women. And women, generally speaking, don't care about Slash. What they care about is buying guitars that fit them, guitars that they can play and learning how to play. This is Fender Guitars website. Fender's thriving. They're doing really well. They paid attention to the market. They empathize with their customers and they're building products and services that actually meet customer need. They're delivering customer value and their business is thriving. By paying attention to what's happening in the marketplace, they're adjusting the way they deliver that value through code, through product, through service, right? And they're thriving and succeeding. And what they're doing here is they're taking a user-centered perspective on the success of their products and services, right? Not a feature-centered perspective, right? But a user-centered perspective. How are we making our customers more successful, right? Who are the customers and what are they trying to do? And what this lens ends up doing is it changes the definition of done. If we're talking about the agile language, right? It changes the definition of done from output, making a thing, to outcome, changing customer behavior. That's our new definition of done, right? Did people buy more stuff? Did they learn how to play guitar? If so, are they coming back and telling their friends? That's what we're looking at. And it's these outcomes that tell us when we've delivered customer value. And most importantly, it's these outcomes that tell us when we're done. When do we move on to the next thing? When do we stop working on something, right? Outcomes help us do that. And that's one of the key things to take away here is that change in customer behavior is our measure of success. That's our first principle. Customer value and business value are the same thing. 
Principle number two, working in short cycles, right? Upfront planning, trying to predict the future, trying to understand exactly what the software will do when we're done and how people will use it is an exercise in frustration and mostly futility. When we do long-term product planning and roadmaps, right, this is what we're asking our product development teams to do. This is what we're asking our software engineers to do, our product managers, and our designers. They're trying to just divine the future, right? But we build iterative, continuous systems. We don't know what it's going to look like in the future. And we don't know what the competition is going to do. And we don't know what our customers are going to do with these products and services. By working in shorter cycles, we learn more quickly. And I want to be clear, by shorter cycle, I mean anything shorter than what you're doing today. So we can look at the digitally native companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook and see how, how often and how regularly they deploy code, and that's fantastic for inspiration. But if you work in a bank and it takes you six months to ship something today and you can get it down to three months, that's a win. Right? It's twice as fast as you were before. That's good. And our goal with these short cycles, these sprints, these iterations, is to collect evidence. Right? If we're moving from doubt to certainty, at the end of every cycle, we look back and we say, hey, does it still make sense to be working on this? Is the feedback from the market, from our, from our teams, from whatever, right, says, uh, saying that this is still a good idea? If so, you get to take the next short cycle forward. Not the next nine, the next one, right? And if at any point, at the end of these short cycle, we retrospect, we reflect, and we say, hey, are we still headed in the right direction? Are we still making sense? Right? If the feedback says, no, this doesn't make sense anymore, then we have to change course. That's agility. Right? That's the thing that we talked about at the beginning. Right? Shorter cycles means lower investments, means lower risk, means it's easier to change course. Right? And as our friend, uh, the richest man in the world, likes to say, the great thing about fact-based decisions is that they should overrule the hierarchy, right? We're collecting evidence at the end of each one of these cycles, and we try to make evidence-based decision-making based on customer behavior. To help you do that, let me give you the two key questions I teach every team that I work with, okay? At the end of every cycle, as you're planning your next cycle, ask these two questions, okay? First is this. What's the next most important thing we need to learn? Not ship. Learn, right? That's a, that's a very explicit choice there. What's the next most important thing we need to learn? In other words, what's, where, where's the risk in the thing that we're building? And look, sometimes that's going to be market risk or user risk or design risk. Other times it's going to be technical risk. All of those conversations are important, right? What's the next most important thing we need to learn? And then what's the least amount of work that we need to do to learn that? Right? How can we de-risk this the fastest so that we don't spend four cycles or ten cycles to find out that it, we shouldn't have done this? Right? So we spend one or two max. Right? Those are your experiments. Those are your MVPs. Right? Those are the things that we put out into market to understand how well we're going to solve this particular business problem. Okay. Principle number three, retros. Now, I told you uh, that, that the manifesto doesn't have this, like, you will stand up every day at 9.15 kind of stuff. But it does talk about retros. And retros are great, right? Retros allow you to kind of look back on a short time frame and just talk about, hey, what worked well, right? Let's keep doing that. And what didn't work well, let's change that. Right? Um, we talk about, I mean, there's a thousand ways to do them, right? There's this, this is, I use this one a lot. Um, I, I found this one on the internet. I like this one. Um, I've, done, I've done these, the 4L, 4Ls retro, whatever it takes. It, the, the framework ultimately doesn't matter. The conversation matters, right? And the conversation has two purposes for retros. First, you're going to make the product better. What did we learn as we shipped product, as we got code into users' hands, and what's different about that? And then second, we're going to improve the process. Hey, last week, you know, it took us forever to get the designs to the developers, right? And uh, by the time they got it, there was no time to implement the design to its fullest. The designers were pissed. The developers were pissed. What do we do about that next time, right? If that happened for, for a one-week sprint or a two-week sprint, okay, right? As long as we tried something different the next time. If that happens for 10 sprints in a row, retros help you undo that kind of stuff, okay? Principle number four, go and see, right? This is, there's all kinds of names for this. Go and go into the Gemba. You hear this from, from lean folks, right? Uh, Tom Peters, famous business management guru, talks about managing by walking around, right? Managing, and look, if you're not a manager, forget that managing by and just leave the walking around part, 
right? Walk around the office, see what other teams are doing, right? See what's working for them, right? How do they structure their, their meetings, their cadences, their practices, and then amplify the good patterns. Bring them to your team. If you manage some teams, bring them to multiple teams, and don't worry about the labels. If something works inside your organization, it makes people productive, more collaborative. It builds that shared language. I don't care if it's lean or agile or design thinking. Who cares? If it works, amplify those patterns. And do that, but just walk, you'd be amazed, particularly if you've got a big office, right, what people are doing in the corners. They're building really interesting practices. You can learn from them and amplify those patterns. Principle number five, test only your high-risk hypotheses. Remember, I told you, what do you need to learn first? What's the least amount of work that you need to do to learn that? The least amount of work you need to do to learn that is your experiment. Now look, we rarely, if ever, have 100% budget for learning, right? We have to ship. We have to ship product, we have to ship code. How do we test the most important things? Now look, hypothesis statements are, are our best guess about how we, how we solve a particularly thorny or risky business problem um, for our customers, right? And so we believe that we can change behavior if a specific customer base gets some kind of a benefit from a feature that we want to build, right? If you were to fill this out, it could look something like this, right? We believe that a 50% increase in retention, right? That's a change in customer behavior, will be achieved if college students have more time for schoolwork, that's their benefit, right? Um, with a food delivery service from the university cafeteria. Right? That might be a good idea, it might be a bad idea, right? but these are our hypotheses. And we're going to have a lot of these as we look to build new products and services for our team. But the problem is, is you can't test everything because we have to ship stuff as well. And so I like to use this framework to focus on which hypotheses you should actually test, how to focus your learning. If we're going to build lean thinking, uh, design thinking into our agile processes, Right? We've got to focus on the most important thing we need to learn next. The hypotheses that fall into this quadrant, the quadrant of high risk and high perceived value. And to be clear, it's perceived because you don't know. You think it's a good idea, but you don't know because you can't predict the future. Right? And risk, again, is going to be contextual. It might be technically challenging. It might be a, a business risk or an adjacent market or whatever it is. The stuff that falls into this top right corner, that's where your learning activities go. That's where your design thinking, your lean startup, your research, your discovery work, right? Those are the things, those are where you apply those processes, right? Because if something falls into this bucket, high risk, low value, just throw it out. Don't work on that. If something falls um, in the top left, if you believe it's high value and it's low risk, just build it. Write the stories, put it in your backlog, write the code, ship it, right? And if your hypotheses fall down here in the bottom left, you certainly don't need to test them. In most cases, you don't even need to build them. There might be some table stakes stuff, stuff that you have to have to run in your, to operate in your market or in your industry, but you certainly don't need to test that. So if you're gonna build lean, lean startup, design thinking, UX, research into your agile processes, focus it on the high risk, high value hypotheses. Next, one of the most important things that I've learned uh, in my career, do less more often. It's one way to harness these new processes, these new ideas of Agile and, and again, Lean Startup and so forth into a way that, that everyone can accept, regardless of what they do on your team. Right? So instead of trying to do a, a kind of a, a, a massive discovery phase up front or a big design phase or a research phase up front, right, we do less. We do a much smaller scale uh, effort we just do it more regularly because we've got this time box that repeats itself every week or every two weeks, right? I'll give you an example. Um, I spent a lot of time in the first half of my career doing traditional research, sitting on the other side of the one-way mirror, eating a lot of candy for two days. And uh, if, you've ever, if you've ever done that, I don't know if you have. Um, but I can tell you, and, you know, 10 people come through on the first day, 10 people come through, and they test your product for you on the second day. And I guarantee you that by the end of the first day, you know everything that the people are going to say on the second day. Right? Complete waste of time right? if, you're doing, if you're doing good, good work. Instead, right, again, coming back to this question, what's the fastest way to learn the next most important thing? And we can run these experiments based on what do we need to learn next? What's the fastest way to do that? Let me show you some examples. Um, uh, the Echo. In this particular case, Amazon realized that the most important thing they needed to learn next was 
what are people going to ask this thing? And what's a good answer? Right? Voice interface, that's probably good. Right? Now look, Amazon is good at writing code and deploying code and shipping it regularly. They could have just written stuff and seen how it works. Instead, what they did was they ran an experiment. They did less more often. They, they built what was called a Wizard of Oz where they put a customer with a fake Alexa in one room and a microphone. And the customer would talk to the Alexa and ask it questions. And in the room, in an adjacent room sat an engineer with a laptop and he heard those questions and he would type those queries into Google get the answer, and then speak those answers back in a microphone. So it feels like the Alexa is answering your questions, right? The reality, there's nothing there. They did less, and they do this kind of exper experimentation more often. They're learning, right, based on the most important thing they need to learn next, right? Here's another great example. I love this example. I came across this just this year. Um, do you guys know what's happening here? That's right, testing self-driving cars. This is Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company has been building cars for 100 years. Right? What got them here is not going to get them the self-driving cars. Integrated software, integrated hardware. Right? The most important thing they needed to learn, and the fastest way that they could do that was by disguising this guy as a car seat. They put him behind the wheel, and then they put him on the road. Why, right? To learn the next most important thing, which was how will people react to a self-driving car? Right? Because, look, they could have written the code, they could have built the hardware, they could have integrated it all and hoped that it would work. But the results here could be tragic. And so instead, they did less more often. Right? They did product discovery to, uh, to test their highest risk hypothesis, which in this case literally involved a costume. That was it, right? Again. Principle number seven, working as a balanced team. This is the one that gets broken again and again and again and again. And it's like book after book after article after blog post after conference talk talks about this. And it still happens so rarely. Teams. Successful modern software development teams are small, six to ten people. Okay? Smaller teams are more accountable, they're more agile, they move more quickly, there's no hiding in a small team. Okay? Successful modern product teams are dedicated, they work on one thing at a time, not three. Everybody on the team works on one thing at a time. Some reason, it's, it's, it's some, some reason organizations across the world seem to think that it's engineers can only work on one thing at a time, but designers and product managers can support multiple projects at the same time. Dedicated teams, much more successful. Co-located, ideally, I know the previous session was about remote teams, right? And I recognize that this is our reality today. Co-located is best. If you're not co-located, then use the tools that you learned about in the last session but in order for those tools to work, you have to be awake at the same time, right? So that's the key here. If you're not co-located, overlapping time zones, okay? Cross-functional teams, right? All too often I hear about the developer team, right? Or the delivery team and the discovery team, right? Those need to be the same people, product design, engineering, working together on the same thing at the same time. It's the only way that collaboration works. Otherwise, it's just waterfall. We're just handing off to each other over time any way you slice it. And again, just like the lean folks taught us, we want to make our teams autonomous and empowered. If we're working in short cycles, if we're learning, if we're, if we're iterating every week or every two weeks, so what if we get it wrong? Right? We don't need to micromanage these folks. If they make a mistake, they'll find out at the end of that cycle and they'll course correct. That's the whole point of this way of working. We have to let our teams do their jobs and make the tactical day-to-day -day decisions so they don't have to run it up 85 approval levels to make that happen. And it's amazing what happens. This is, when you do that, I, um, this is an award that I got um, in the early 2000s from my team. I worked on a, on, a, on a browser at AOL back because we were working, I was a designer in case you're wondering, I still am, right? I'm working with my engineers and I got a rogue developer award for inspiring undocumented creativity in engineers. Why? Because we talked to each other, <laughs> right? And we shared knowledge and we were on the same team working on things at the same time. So it, it was a bit of a joke, but again, it makes the point. 
Three more things. Principle number eight, one of the most important things that you need to be clear about is radical transparency as an organization. How do you build transparency about what we're working on, why we're working on it, how we're doing, and what success looks like? If you can build that into your teams, into your team, start with your team and then scale that out, the collaboration is better. People are far more engaged in making the customer successful. And there's lots of ways to do this. Rituals work really particularly well. Uh, this is the Karate Kid. Please, how many of you have seen the Karate Kid? All right, good. Phew. good. We don't have to explain this one too much. Uh, by the way, you want a really quick sobering fact? Uh, Ralph Macchio, Daniel's son, he's 50 years old today. <laughs> Hits home a little bit. Anyway, Daniel's son comes to Mr. Miyagi and says, hey, I want to learn karate. Mr. Miyagi says, that's great. Paint the fence. He says, but I want to learn karate. He says, that's terrific. Wax my car. <laughs> right? Unbeknownst to Daniel's son, he's learning karate. Right? He's waxing. He's getting the motions. Right? Rituals, particularly the, the, the scrum, the agile rituals, work really well to teach teams transparency. If you just went to a team and said, be transparent, they'd be like, all right, whatever. Right? Stand-ups. Do a stand-up every day. Right? That's the beauty of stand-ups. They drive transparency. Now, they, the teams might not know why they're doing stand-ups at first. Right? But it becomes very clear that if every day you, you have to stand up, I have to stand up in front of my team, and I have to say to my team, well, uh, yesterday uh, I bought some shoes online. Today I'm going to put some money on the horses. <laughs> and what's getting in my way is all this work stuff. Right? That conversation gets really old really fast. Right? Stand-ups drive transparency in what the team is doing. Uh, scrum of scrums, demo days. Demo days are fantastic. You can demo working code. You can demo an experiment that you ran. You can demo a customer conversation. It doesn't matter as long as you're showing the work that your team is doing. Drive that transparency in there. Access to customers drives transparency. Make sure that you seek it out and that your company grants it to you. Right? We're coming up on Black Friday in the United States. This is literally what it looks like. <laughs> it's actually uh, this coming uh, Friday. It's going to be fantastic. And the reality is that the more cost customer access that you get, the more you can get a sense of what's actually viable. Because this concept of MVP permeates the way that we work. And we all have a different version of what minimum actually means. But access to customers tells us, is it actually viable? Right? And that's the key here, is to use that customer feedback to drive our decision making and to drive that home. Right? Um, the other thing that helps drive transparency in this particular case is access to data. There was a conversation in the keynote this morning around Star Wars or Star Trek. I am strongly on the Star Trek side, so you'll see a lot of that over here. Um, but access to data is key. I used to work at a company where the only way to get any kind of analytics or, or reporting was to spend a certain amount of hours per month in the BIQ, the Business Intelligence or Business Insights Group Q, right? And the CEO could always jump the Q if he wanted to. So you didn't get your report that month, you don't know how your products are doing, right? We give our employees access to electricity and heat and air conditioning and coffee. We give them access to data. Everyone should be able to measure what's happening with their products so they understand how things are going. That drives transparency in our decision making. Two more things. Principle number nine. And this one's tough. If you're not in a leadership position, then this one's tough. But it's a good, it's a good question to ask. Right? What are the incentives that we have as software developers? Right? As product managers, as designers, as team members. What's the incentive that we have? Because uh, it really changes, right, to help, w based on the incentive to, to, to help us determine, um, you know, what our ass is on the line for, right? That's the key in all of this, right? In other words, what are you getting paid to do every, every day at work? Are you getting paid to ship software, right? Or are you getting paid to deliver customer value? Because those are two very, very different things, right? Are you there to create output, period, end of story, as long as we get the features out? Or are you there to make customers successful? Right? And in most organizations that are trying to build this collaboration between lean, agile, and design thinking, they are asking their teams to deliver customer value, and they're paying them to deliver features. And those are two contradictory things. And that's where a lot of this stuff breaks down. So if you're not in a leadership position, I would ask this question. I would, I would, I would review it, and I would bring this up with your leaders and your managers to understand what's driving uh, the way that we get paid and what we're being asked to do, because that's often where a lot of this conflict lasts. OK, last principle is this. The only way that these, these ideas of lean, agile, design thinking work well together is if we make learning a first-class citizen of our backlog. 
Right? I've worked in too many organizations where we've got sort of the real work backlog, which is all dev work, and then design, product management, research, product discovery, all was over here. Right? And the team's coming into work, and they've got at least two backlogs with number one priorities on them to choose from. Guess which one they're picking from every single time? The dev work, every single time. Right? We've got to unify the work into one place, and learning has to be a part of that, right? And look, lots of ways to do this. The easiest thing to do is just to track it, to visualize it the same exact way that you track every other piece of work, right? You make cards, virtual, physical, whatever, cards for the dev work, do it for the learning work as well. Write down your hypotheses. Write down how you're going to do that learning, right? What's, what's the experiment? What's the, what's the MVP that we're going to build? Assign it to someone. And if you're going to estimate, and I'm not opening up that can of worms ever, right? It's your choice. But if you're going to estimate, right, put that on there. And then, once you've done that, put it in your backlog. The same backlog where everything else goes, right? Explicitly prioritize the learning work against the, the delivery work, because there's, there's implications to this, right? Anything that comes downstream from the learning work is inherently at greater risk than the things that come above it. And that's okay, let's talk about that. And if we learn something from our, uh, our, our learning, our discovery activity, right? Our design thinking, our lean startup activity, that changes the downstream prioritization of our work, that's okay. That's agility. And that's the whole point of trying to build this new way of working. And so to kind of summarize all of this together, these are the principles that I covered, and they work with any methodology, right? You can take the practices that work for you, but if you embody these principles, you start to build cross-functional collaborative teams that focus on customer value and ultimately deliver great products and services, right? And I appreciate you listening today, and I will say thank you very much.